Hello, everyone, and good evening. Welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session, and in fact, our first for the 2019-2020 academic year, is titled A Dangerous Unselfishness, Understanding and Teaching the Complex History of Blackface. I am really pleased to be able to uh, welcome you tonight. Uh, the National Humanities Center is located in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, as a research uh, center, we are dedicated to the advancement of humanity scholarship with an annual fellowship class of university scholars and professors who spend their academic year with us if selected uh, here at this beautiful site. Um, and our education work, uh, the work that we're doing tonight is intended to connect uh, experts in their fields, experts in the classroom, that would be our audience tonight, and experts uh, in the scholarship, uh, that would be our guest uh, lecturer tonight. Um, it's important for us to uh, to acknowledge the value of a deep understanding of these complex topics and the ways in which the humanities as disciplinary tools allow the students that we work with, whether they're undergraduate class uh, students at Princeton like uh, Dr. Barnes or their K-12 students like many of you are teaching, that understanding and, and using the different kinds of processes behind these uh, these disciplines really does go a long way to developing an informed and engaged citizenry. My name is Andy Mink and I'm the Vice President for Education. Again, I want to welcome all of you back. Uh, it's fun to see so many names that I recognize uh, in the attendees list and the roster tonight. Um, it's nice to see Jacqueline Dukes, who's in Shaker Hills, Ohio, who I think attended most, if not all, of our sessions last year. And I, I hope that you had a good summer. And Daisy Mercado out in uh, California. Um, and even some folks nearby, uh, like Mar Martha Regalis at the North Carolina School of Science and Math. I think if you look at the chat box and you see uh, yourself introducing uh, yourself and seeing where folks are from, it's it's really pretty refreshing to see um, all of these educators who are coming from across the country and um, and interested in and willing to engage in this community and this conversation. Um, I also appreciate that all of you have, have likely taught school all day. And so you're, you're coming right out of your classrooms, right away from your students and spending more time doing work after work. If for some reason you can't hear my voice, and of course, if you can hear it, then uh, then everything is working well. But if you can't hear my voice either now or at some point during tonight's session, there are several audio issues that you can likely troubleshoot from your end. Um, if at some point we kind of fade in and out or there's a static or a, a delay of some kind, and the number one solution starts with closing the session and then re-entering the room. Oftentimes, uh, that'll kind of kickstart the system. But you might also check the settings uh, in your toolbar, or you might look at the different uh, microphone and audio settings in your own, your own laptop. Unfortunately, if that is happening on your end and not ours or anybody else's, it's probably something that you'll have to resolve on the fly. And again, I would start by closing the session and coming back in. I also want to make sure that I acknowledge and thank uh, my colleagues, my staff at the National Humanities Center in the Education Department, Libby Taylor, who most of you receive emails from and registration uh, details from as our Education Programs Coordinator, and Mike Williams as our Education Programs Manager. All of the work that we do at the Center, uh, in particular in terms of education, um, is the product of the three of us and then a whole team of consultants around the country. And so if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out uh, to us either via social media or by email, and we'll be happy to help you uh, with, with those things. A couple of quick reminders tonight. Um, many of you, again, have joined sessions with us in the past, but I always like to at least start by refreshing our memory of the way this works. Uh, tonight's webinar will be audio only, which means that you'll hear my voice and Ray Lynn's voice that uh, accompanies an associated PowerPoint. Um, your interaction with us then comes through the chat box, which is at the very bottom of the go to training control panel. I would encourage you to make comments. I would encourage you to ask questions. Part of my job as the moderator is to pull those questions into uh, what we're discussing uh, out loud and verbally. Um, I'd also encourage you to speak directly to each other, but I'd encourage you to keep that at a, at a civil and, um, and professional tone. And uh, you know, part of the goal here is for you to, to reflect not only on the content and the scholarship, but it's also to talk about ways that you might take this to students at younger levels. I'd also encourage you to use our pre-approval form for the entire semester and year's worth of webinars. Many of you take multiple sessions and one quick and easy way to document that for your administration is by downloading this form, uh, checking the ones that you plan to attend or have attended, and attaching the certificate that you receive afterwards and then taking that to uh, your administration. 
I also am pleased to be able to announce uh, the addition of some new webinars. Um, we open registration for this year's sessions, uh, this year's series on August 15th, and within about two days, over 90% of the seats are full. So we have uh, found some empty dates on our calendar and added these four new sessions. Registration is currently open for each of them. Uh, we are still capped at a capacity of 200, although we're exploring ways to uh, potentially bring in additional seats, but without losing the interactivity that we have in, in this work. Uh, two of these sessions are in the fall semester, two in the spring semester. Um, and if you're interested in any of those, I'd encourage you to go and sign up uh, pretty quickly. I think when I last looked, they were filling uh, just as rapidly. And I hope that the topics are both relevant and, and compelling and will bring you to them. I also want to announce that uh, as a way of not only appreciating your contributions and attendance to these sessions, but as a way to reward you, to incentivize your attendance at our sessions, we have also added two additional what we're calling VIP appreciation sessions. So at the end of each semester, we will take a look at our roster of registrants and attendees. And if you, an individual, have attended 100% of what you signed up for, then we're going to give you the opportunity to register for this, this bonus session. Uh, we've got a wonderful session scheduled in January on the barbaric legacy of sugar uh, with Mark Aronson and Marina Butos uh, from New Jersey. Uh, they wrote a, just a seminal book on sugar and its role in, um, in the development of the global uh, sugar economy. And at the end of the spring semester, we'll be working with Carolyn Denard from Georgia State University on the life and writings of Tony Morrison. Both sessions will be absolutely fantastic and, of course, topical and relevant. Uh, so I would encourage you, if you've signed up for a session for the fall, uh, please attend it. Please show up and join us. Uh, if for some reason you can't attend, as all of our schedules uh, change and, and, and often things pop up, uh, just go ahead and remove yourself from that session so the seat will free up for others to take it. Uh, the National Humanities Center has got a whole nother world and universe of education materials I'd encourage and hope that you find accessible. These include classroom ready lessons and primary source collections, scholarly essays and podcasts. These are all free and open and I would encourage you to visit our website to identify and define those that are useful for your teaching. We also have an online course catalog that will be uh, uh, promoted and available to you this year. Our first uh, course is called Cut the Bull, How the Humanities Can Help Develop Critical Media Literacy. And we are currently accepting applications for that course. They will close, the application process will close on September 20th. So again, go to our website, uh, nationalhumanitycenter.org, and you can see the, um, the ways in which you can sign up for that five-week course on media literacy. And then finally, we also have a two-day workshop on using GIS geospatial technologies in the classroom, particularly with a global studies uh, focus. Uh, this will be hosted in North Carolina in October. Uh, so if you are uh, nearby or if you feel like you can travel some for these two days, we'd love to have you join us at the center. And again, there's an application process that is available on our website. I also want to thank uh, our Teacher Advisory Council. Each year, uh, we identify somewhere between 15 and 20 educators from across the country who work closely with us on uh, developing uh, relevant materials, on reviewing curricula that we put together, and uh, representing us at various um, regional and statewide and district level conferences. So uh, this year we have a, a wonderful team of educators who will be working with us. And I also want to thank some of our previous uh, members, people like Ginger Park, who is almost always in our webinar series, and I always enjoy her comments. And I want to welcome Mariel Herzog, who's also in tonight's session, who will be joining this year's uh, cohort. If you're interested in uh, contributing and being a part of our Teacher Advisory Council, we open applications each spring and would love to have you uh, submit your, your name. So all of that is really just a precursor for tonight's longer conversation, and I'm very, very pleased to uh, welcome Raylan Barnes to, uh, to our series. Raylan is an assistant professor of history at Princeton University, and I've included her contact information, both email and Twitter handle, uh, at her invitation, and I think that's probably not a, um, an idle uh, invitation. If you have questions after tonight's session, if there are things that we discuss or materials that you view or something in the PowerPoint that is particularly compelling, uh, please feel free to reach out to either me or to Raylan and continue that conversation. Um, Raylan, are you with us? I just unmuted you. I am. I am hey, here. Fantastic. Good Thank evening. you. Oh, I, you're right. It has an underscore, and I'll be happy to put that on there uh, for the for the final 
PowerPoint no here. Graylin, I really want to thank you for joining us. And um, I actually want to start uh, with this introduction uh, with with sort of a surprise question, if you don't mind. Mm, here we go. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and I and I feel I feel compelled to do this because I'm actually joining the session tonight from Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, and. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm literally, I can see if I look out my window, I can almost see uh, the dome at Monticello and I can see where Sally Hemings um, lived with Thomas Jefferson. If I drove 25 miles uh, up Route 20, I could find myself at the home, literally the home of the Constitution where James Madison looked out over his, uh, over his property as he sat at his study and conceived of the Constitution while enslaved people worked for him. I shouldn't say worked for him, enslaved people ran his plantation. And I'm also literally just a block, just just footsteps from uh, the scene of the horrific event uh, two summers ago, two Augusts ago here in Charlottesville that resulted in loss of life. So for me, tonight's session um, is really relevant. You know, I, I know exactly why this is on the schedule and, and hopefully what we'll discuss. But I'm wondering as a punchline if you can if you could tell us why this topic is so important outside of of a place like Central Virginia, where our governor just you know two years ago was discovered to have used blackface in his in his past. Why why is this important to all of our folks in California who are joining us in Illinois and Texas? Um, to, oh, tell, trick tell questions, what, trick answer. Yeah. Um, so I will get into this, but it is the number one uh, misconception that blackface is a Southern creation. It is not. It's invented in New York City, and my book argues that. Uh, the epicenter and the highest per capita show rate actually occurs in California after World War II because of the federalization of blackface and its requirement in the California state curriculum. Um, and so when you, uh, the other thing that I do give a lecture on touring around the country is the forced requirement of blackface in all of the Japanese American internment camps. And so when you understand that requirement for almost a century for people in California, something like the 1992 LA riots looks quite different when you have that larger context. Um, and also things like Hollywood. Hollywood, of course, is the largest purveyor beyond the federal government of these stereotypes from Birth of a Nation, Gone with the Wind, um, you know, all the way up to some films that we'll be discussing um, that came out quite recently. But I will also say, um, so in addition to being a professor at Princeton University, I'm the president of what's called, very fancy uh, long title, the Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography at the Rare Book School of the University of California, I'm sorry, at the University of Virginia, which is, right. which is a fancy way to say um, we study books and their significance in time. And I've been going to UVA in Charlottesville every summer since 2013. Mm -hmm. And as I said, blackface was not normally in the South with a few very rare exceptions uh, early on in the 19th century. And Charlottesville is one of them. And so um, as someone who had gone there every summer and witnessed a lot of quite frightening um, sort of Confederate imagery, I felt unsafe um, and uncomfortable at times on campus in the past now they've taken incredible strides to address these things and the tone is completely different post 2017 um, but i will say i was not surprised at all that that was the location of where that confrontation took place um, because thomas jefferson in a lot of ways is the uh, legislative architect for American racism. And so a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today and their cultural representation are in direct response to policies that um, he created. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you so much. And uh, and I think it's it's important, particularly for our teachers, our educators who are joining us tonight to, to recognize that, um, that the, the, the geography we assume is often not the story that we need to tell. So, um, I'm going to hand you the mouse, and I'm very anxious to see how you address this. Okay. All right. Let's test there you out. Go. Okay. Let's see. Are you advancing? All right. So, first of all, I want to provide just a recommended key terms list for students in case you do want to lecture either at the high school or the college level. If you're teaching um, younger than that, I would definitely suggest focusing in on Stephen Foster music um, in particular. 
which we will get into. And I'm going to go a little quickly through the early slides, but it's my understanding that you will have the ability to go back and revisit these. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Okay, perfect. All right, here we go. Uh, and also, best practices, I always do this for my students. If you want to cite this, here is the citation. All right, so in less than half a decade since Barack Obama's presidency, we now, as a Twitter activist pointed out this week, have more governors and gubernatorial candidates with blackface scandals than we have African-American governors. So this evening, what we're gonna talk about is how and why we got here. In February, 2019, when the news story broke that the Democratic governor of Virginia, uh, Ralph Northam, wore either blackface or Klan regalia in his med school yearbook, followed by this insane press conference that I have screenshot for you, where his wife had to physically restrain him as he sized up the press room to try and moonwalk across the stage on live national television to recreate his other admitted blackface costume as Michael Jackson, I suddenly found myself at the center of a national conversation about blackface. My research into amateur blackface minstrel shows started to reframe how we understood and contextualized essentially what amateur blackface was as a distinctive genre, which we're going to get into, where it took place. So I've already said, surprise, surprise, North and West, and then it does spin back around to the South, which we'll get into. Um, and also how long that this uh, occurred. Um, and I show this slide not because I think I'm fancy, but because I think it's really important. So many students, uh, high school seniors and college freshmen are scared to major in history. They want to know what they can do with their history degree. And I want to point out that this actually was my junior research paper that just kept growing and growing and growing and spinning out of control the more and more I found new things. Um, and so I just want to say, if you ever have a student who wants to talk to somebody who has done digital humanities, television, documentary, all, all sorts of things with a history degree, I'm really happy to, to talk to them. And it is kind of fancy. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. So Americans largely know blackface is controversial, but we can't tell you why. They have no concept of its origin and its scope like the fact that over 70 million Americans went to federally sponsored blackface shows during the Great Depression alone. 70 million, I wanna underscore that. Or why it was pushed underground. And there's an excellent reason for that confusion. Blackface history was considered so taboo and so ugly that it was censored in the archives like the Library of Congress, preventing a lot of historians from doing this research. You can see here from this uh, slide that there were teachers who were actually fired or put on leave because they were teaching blackface. And I will say this lesson plan, I would be in complete agreement with. This next one, I am not. In case you ever uh, have a question or a doubt, don't ever wear blackface, don't ever reenact historical um, uh, racist situations. That is not good, pe good pedagogy. Um, and also grant fund new bodies were basically of the opinion that this was so ugly and so um, controversial that it was best to quote, leave it hidden and buried is what a uh, funder said to me about my research. In many ways, I argue that this confusion about what blackface is and this sort of lockdown about talking about it is a strange blowback um, and an important legacy of a actual civil rights victory that made blackface politically taboo by 1970. Um, so we have a long history of protesting Birth of a Nation in 1915. This is from Walt Disney's Song of the South. And then my work also looks at the NAACP's attempts to ban blackface from school curriculum, especially during the Cold War, which is one of the only times they're actually advocating for book banning. Um, and the questions that I got when I was dealing with the Governor Northam scandal um, were really uh, the same everywhere I went. So what did amateur blackface minstrelsy? Where did it start? Who did this? And there was a universal expression that this was a Southern racist thing. Um, and so these are all the things that I'm gonna talk about tonight. So just to give you a brief overview, I'm gonna give you a basic introduction. We're gonna go over what a minstrel show is, how the genre developed, who participated, 
I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the historiography. So if you're interested in something in particular, you can continue to look into it. And then with the key characters and stereotypes, I'm going to show you a series of images and we're going to have a conversation. And I would really love it if you could analyze the images, um, you know, provide any of your thoughts or ideas and help us brainstorm together. And then if you have questions about the afterlife, meaning blackface post-1970, or if you want to have a conversation about teaching um, and specific strategies, I am definitely here to help you. Um, so the other last thing I wanted to say, so yes, I do teach at Princeton University. I also run a website called US History Scene, which is the website, the landing page that I sent out with your resources. Um, and I actually developed this because I was a disabled student um, in college due to a, a car accident, a brain injury. And so one of the things that I do, I have a team of graduate students, and if any uh, instructors let us know specific topics that you need help with, we are basically here to help, and every summer we create content. So definitely feel free to let me know if you have something that you um, need for your classroom. All right, so let's dive in. So my forthcoming book, Darkology, When the American Dream Wore Blackface, uh, in this book, I basically argue that the century between the American Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, so roughly 1860 to 1970, was an era in which a strange, dark, pervasive, and highly visual world, so this is in no way underground, uh, world of amateur blackface minstrelsy, took hold in nearly every American town and city, turning everyday Americans into blackface performers, artists, costume designers, illustrators, um, and more. So darkology was the sort of insider slang used by blackface performers to describe the process of learning to represent authentic black life. And that's important because a lot of people, uh, especially in shows that had all white uh, cities or all white schools, and obviously this is at the height of segregation, a lot of people believe that they were actually learning something authentic or real, something like a slave, um, spiritual song when in fact they were learning a coon song written by a white American. But this idea of darkology was you would learn to physically embody stereotypes from scripts, programs, and these racist how-to guides that would show you how to um, speak or walk or perform in a stereotypical way. Um, and so to, do, to prove that blackface continued to accelerate throughout the 20th century, I cataloged 10,000 of these minstrel plays that are scattered across the United States. I did see that there's quite a few people from Ohio. So Cincinnati is actually a really interesting hub for the publication of these. So is Chicago um, and also the creation of lithographs. So most racist imagery that we have comes from New York, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, Chicago. Um, it is not created in the American South. And these are really books that are riddled with white supremacist humor. Um, and so it's telling a different story, unlike um, the antebellum stage or the Hollywood story, which we will also briefly go into. And what I was interested in was thinking about how blackface became a prime pathway to political power during Reconstruction and Jim Crow. And Jim Crow, of course, is a historical era that is literally named after America's most popular uh, blackface character. And so to me, that connection was quite literal. Um, and so to do this, if you read my Washington Post article, I'm looking at blackface in segregated schools, in the military, churches, political organizations, and even the White House. Um, and so this previously unknown genre then, when you really read these scripts, transmitted word for word, lyric by lyric, and image by image, antebellum popular culture and racist ideology that's born of slavery, born when Thomas Jefferson and Jackson are alive through almost every major governmental, economic, and civic institution down through the Nixon administration. And so there's this incredible longevity of racist imagery and language that is um, directly coming out of essentially the 1830s. So before I get into, um, here's a, uh, a photograph of one of the school plays. So before we continue, I want to talk a little bit about classroom conduct. So first, as we all know, it's crucial that you establish a safe place in your classroom for learning and exploration. And you have to reiterate that on the day that you decide that you're going to teach blackface. We want to make sure that everybody feels safe and confident in the classroom. 
And it's okay to give a warning when you're using disturbing images. So similar to how I handle slavery um, and lynching imagery, I sometimes let students know, we're gonna be looking at some pretty grotesque racial caricature in class today. And I will let them know if there is a particularly upsetting slide. And I say, if you want to look down at your paper or at your computer, that's okay. Because we don't know everybody's um, trauma and story. And I think some of our students don't need this, but at the same time, this is absolutely a history that we need to have a conversation with. So I wanna stress, um, similar to our introduction, that difficult histories, while they are unpleasant and uncomfortable, they really empower our students because when we can show the literal construction of stereotypes and reveal how they're made and where they are circulated, um, we really negate their power. Stereotypes feel true because they are so ingrained in our society and they're so omnipresent. But when you're able to go through a lecture and deconstruct them, you're actually empowering our students with the truth. And so that's sort of um, the uh, message that I want to relate to you on that. And finally, in terms of finding sources, there are a few places that I would recommend. The Digital Public Library of America has an amazing website full of a lot of blackface sources. If you put in Stephen Foster, Christy Minstrel, Virginia Minstrel, uh, library, sorry, uh, yeah, library of Congress, and then also Harvard University digitized their Minstrel collection. So if you Google Harvard University Minstrel collection, you will also find that. All right, so what is a minstrel show? What are we even talking about? All right, so part of what makes the study of minstrelsy both incredibly exciting and maddening is the ubiquity of the form. Once you start to look for minstrelsy, as journalists are now finding out, you see it everywhere in American culture in the way teenagers flash gang signs in their Instagram selfies, and as you see a lot of celebrity Halloween scandals, um, most recently, obviously, Megan Kelly's concern about performing um, or dressing up as Diana Ross in blackface. But what we're actually gonna talk about today is more of the root form of this more familiar performance of racial and envy, which is essentially Americans performing as black Americans. So it's almost impossible for historians to pinpoint the exact moment modern blackface as a theatrical makeup technique began, but there are a few close uh, estimations. The first being Queen Anne, the first recorded British person to wear blackface for Ben Johnson's 1605 play, The Mask of Blackness, and the other popular starting point for widespread blackface use for performance would be Shakespeare's Othello. But for the purposes of American history classes, there is one very clear starting point for blackface in America, and that is the infamous night of November 25th, 1832, when Thomas Dixon Rice, or T.D. Rice, unleashed his blackface character, Jumpin' Jim Crow, on stage in New York City at the Bowery Theater. And this is just a year after the Nat Turner's Rebellion and about 10 months before um, the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833. And one thing that I wanna argue is, so you'll, you'll see this, this image in a lot of blackface texts, um, and they're talking about professional global celebrity blackface performances. But I wanna argue that this is actually amateur from the moment it begins, because if you look at this image, you'll see that hundreds of men have actually rushed the stage. There's policemen, there's military men, and they're sort of crowding around T.D. Rice and his fiddler. And what they're actually doing um, in the 19th century is they, if you, if you loved a performance, you would go on stage and demand that it's performed again and again and again. We have records of him performing this sometimes up to 50 times a night um, over and over. And they're watching his footwork. They're trying to learn the dance. So um, there's sort of an immediate imitation that takes off right from the moment that Jim Crow is unleashed on our cultural consciousness. And I also wanna say that, so the sort of height of his initial productions, uh, 1833, coincides with the height of King Cotton and in the interstate slave trade. So this is really a moment where, what is slavery? What will its future be in the United States um, is, is an active conversation. And antebellum minstrels, so before the Civil War, um, in the professional theater performances in New York City usually had two dominant costumes. The first is the plantation slave, 
whose clothes were mismatched and tattered, and they, not, they normally wore wigs, white gloves, or there was the formal tuxedo outfit with tails and top hats, evoking the house slave uniforms. So if you think of Samuel L. Jackson and Django, and um, in both of these costumes, you're trying to cover your white hands and your hair, and then the black face would cover up your uh, skin. And the lines of uh, African-American, fake African-American blackface performers on stage really imitate a lot of the images of the slave auctions that littered Southern cities like Washington, DC, Charleston, and New Orleans, where slaves were normally cleaned up and packaged and put into these suits by companies like Brooks Brothers that specialized in a lot of these slave suits. And they were packaged to sell fantasy to white slave holding nobility. Um, and if you're interested in this, I highly recommend that you read Walter Johnson's seminal work, Soul by Soul, which goes into great depth um, about slave sales and the slave auctions. So in 1842, oh, sorry, we're getting some feedback there. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, <laughs> you, you glitched just for a moment, but you sound fine now. Perfect. Okay. So in 1842, that's when we actually see the first full-scale minstrel show, meaning Jumpin' Jim Crow was one performance and one song, and plenty of people imitated it. By 1842, we have a full-scale minstrel show that encompasses an entire evening's entertainment. And that starts with the Virginia minstrels. The name is um, sort of deceptive because, once again, these are people from New York City. They're just branding themselves as Southerners. And their show followed a three-act formula. The first part, or act one, the oleo, and the afterpiece. So during the first part, a live band blasted an upbeat song like Stephen Foster's Camptown Races, and all of the height, all of the lights remain on. So this blurs the separation between the stage and the audience. They really blend and interact with each other. And an antebellum, uh, what, well, yeah, an antebellum theater, but also up through the early 20th century. Uh, it wasn't refined theater. You would shout at the, audi uh, at the actors, we would banter with them. And so it's a very interactive situation. The minstrel performers paraded down the stage, dancing erratically through the aisles, encouraging the audience to clap their hands, stomp their feet, whistle, shout, laugh, and quote, get the house to shake. And the drunken goal was to get the chandelier to fall. And I'm here to tell you that sometimes with the help of a theater fire or guns, it actually did. Um, and they sit, if you can see in this image, in what's called the semicircle or the, the blackface circle with end men who are the men on the ends in blackface um, and Mr. Interlocutor in the center. So I'm going to show you uh, an annotation here. So Mr. Interlocutor is always in white face. He's not um, blacked up, but the end men on the end, typically Mr. Bones and Mr. Tambo are and they banter with Mr. Interlocutor, who serves as sort of the uh, um, ringmaster, slave master, uh, straight-faced man who asks the questions, and Mr. Bones and Mr. Tambo just sort of go off. The minstrels normally sat in front of an American flag, a plantation scene, a highly, highly romantic plantation scene, um, or steamboat. And the interlocutor normally opened with either Swanee River or the Star Spangled Banner. And then he led what was called the walk around or the cake walk, which is the origin of the famous phrase, that takes the cake. So most of the songs throughout the shows were Stephen Foster's songs. They're primarily written in the 1840s and the 1850s, and they're memorialized all around us today. So the Ice Cream Truck song, Steamboat Willie's song, um, that Mickey Mouse uh, is synchronized to, these are all um, eight songs from the 1840s and the 1850s. So a lot of these songs violent, focus on violent uh, brutalization of black life. Stephen Foster himself thought he was doing something a little bit more complex. He was engaging in what we call sentimentality, trying to make it um, sympathetic. But when it's performed in blackface, it's sort of the message <laughs> does not really translate. So some of the songs that you or your students would know would be Oh Susanna, Camp Town Races, Old Black Joe, Old Folks at Home, and My Old Kentucky Home. And a lot of these songs that are um, basically espousing pro-slavery ideology are later recast as the classic Americana songbook that every child in America is expected to know. And some of them are also considered Western songs. So 
Oh Susiana um, is covered by a ton of uh, country and folk uh, musicians in the 20th century. So the olio, which is the second part, was sort of a spoken word performance. It included dialect imitations of black politicians, stump speeches during political elections, unintelligible sermons by black pastors, lectures given by black professors that were completely riddled with mistakes. Um, and of course, they're basically lampooning black intellectuals ranging from Frederick Douglass to Booker T. Washington and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and so I'm gonna show you some of the examples. So pay attention to this imagery because we are gonna come back to the stereotypes that you see. And these are the covers of the how-to joke book guides that were distributed to children. Um, and so this one was written for high school performances from 1917, and it's called The Great Turkey Stealing Case of Watermelon County and Negro Mock Trial. Um, and it's written by a school principal for high schools to produce. And it was used as late as the 1950s the other one I'm going to show you from 1915 is um, that famous chicken debate. So the use of that would be an example of this made up darky dialect language um, that white people basically master. And it's published by a competing publishing house at Eldridge Entertainment. And so this one takes a little step further. It's not only mocking Booker T. Washington, but also Tuskegee University. So it's basically trying to disavow African Americans of any attempt to argue or reason coherently. Finally, the afterpiece or the third act was an original, what they would call Ethiopian drama that satirically dealt with contemporary political issues. The afterpieces during antebellum America were usually very outlandish comedy routines, but during reconstruction and after the civil war, they take on a very different character. They become quite dark sometimes. And they basically reimagine that the civil war um, resulted in a race war and black rule. And there was sort of an apocalypse of whiteness where a black president makes fantastic and comical blunders and presides over the defilement of everything that white people hold dear. And one of the things that I think is most interesting in these plays is the very first thing this mythical black president does is he takes all the guns away from white America. Um, and this is a real CNN homepage from 2015. So one thing I'm interested in thinking about is also sort of the longer history of um, gun control and um, its representation in minstrel shows. So these historical futures really try to translate these imagined scenarios of racial conflict into cautionary tales. So what might happen to you if you engaged, for example, in um, interracial sexuality or marriage? Nothing good happens is basically the, um, uh, spoiler. Um, and there was a lot of sort of romantic revivals of the Confederacy or what we call the lost cause. So one of the songs, especially in Ohio, actually, that I see um, is a song called Waiting on the Robert E. Lee, which is the Robert E. Lee is a steamboat. So it's romanticizing both uh, steamboat uh, and the cotton economy but also the Confederacy. And one song literally has the line, those minstrel days we miss will make America great again. And so there's a lot of sort of weird temporal shifts where you are watching a show about a um, mythical antebellum America or reconstruction that is all about arguing for a future white supremacy um, uh, you know, rain that we are trying to get back to in this sort of cyclical way, if that makes sense. And the last thing I wanted to say about this is it definitely carries an added weight of credibility in amateur form because these are being performed by your university professors, by your elected political officials, and your family members. And so people have very intense emotional connections to these shows because you don't want to think that your parents or your teacher or your um, elected official is giving you a interpretation of history that's incorrect. And because they are uh, songs, quite romantic and beautiful songs sometimes, there's also this sort of added emotional um, resonance to it. But one thing that's interesting about the first part and the oleo and the afterpiece is sort of behind the shadow of the first part, we can dimly see the outline of the ring shout and the call and response to black churches that develop out of slavery and spirituals. So this call and response is basically the basis of pretty much all rock and roll music. 
And behind the grand eloquence or the mocking of it, of the oleo, stands the oratory of some of the greatest intellectuals the United States has ever produced. So in this way, black-based minstrelsy really lies at the juncture of cultural and intellectual history, because in order to get the jokes, you have to understand the context. And in order to understand their harm, you really have to understand the power that these things insistently and joyfully profaned. All right, so who, part who participated in blackface, especially when we get to amateur blackface? So in a single word, unfortunately, it's almost everybody. The sweeping story of what happens in this century between 1860 and 1970 and its very powerful visual culture is not this fragmented story about marginalized racists hidden in frat boy yearbooks or the backwoods white supremacists of the South that a lot of people try to imagine. This is actually at the center of modern American life. And as I said, the epicenter starts in New York and it moves westward, Chicago, and then to California. And I stress this because pretty much no matter where you're teaching in America, you can find newspaper articles about blackface in your area. And so if you want to work on a project with your students that would do archival or newspaper research, I'm happy to help you with that. Um, so this is a picture of Judy Garland, but I'm going to give you a sort of a small sampling of people who also participated in this. So. William Randolph Hearst, like students at 150 universities that have had to release apologies for blackface scandals in the last two years pre-Northam, uh, performed at a minstrel show in Harvard. Patsy Cline, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, Mickey Rooney, Joan Crawford, Bob Hope, Frank Sinatra, and Hattie McDaniels all really cut their teeth in blackface and learned how to be performers on the minstrel stage. In my Washington Post article, I talk about its prolific use among American presidents. Um, and also I should say that there were people in the civil rights movement who would describe seeing one of these shows or encountering one of these shows as a child. And it was an intense moment of racial consciousness or racial awakening um, to see reflected back to them how white America um, caricaturized them and saw them as sort of this dehumanized strange creature that that doesn't exist this is, does not actually reflect what any human being actually looks like the other thing i want to say is while i am stressing the fact that everyone did it i'm not saying that to excuse it in any capacity what i'm trying to do is show you the all-encompassing power that jim crow had during segregation in america outside of the south that even in these liberal places like hollywood this was the name of the game and blackface really does touch every form of American music. It informs it, it shapes it, and it echoes it. So on this slide, you have images of banjo picking or banjo playing. The banjo is an instrument that comes out of slavery. So that's why uh, blackface performers in the 19th century use that as their main instrument. But the, the performance techniques really become key to everything ranging from ragtime, jazz, folk, country, and rock and roll music. Um, dance specifically, a lot of these blackface shows would use, quote, soft shoe or sand dances. And that's really what evolves into tap dancing. And if you've ever watched a filmed musical in the 20th century, you might notice that the stereotypical tap dance outfit is um, this formal tuxedo, uh, top hat, shiny shoes, white gloves, and a cane which we might just think of as the elite, but it's actually coming out of this minstrel tradition. It's basically, they didn't change the costume and it continues on. And the last thing is really the rapid fire comedic banter between the blackface comedians in this variety show format. So variety shows are uh, one of the first TV comedy show formats. And so even um, the comedy shows that are on um, NBC, CBS, um, they really continue to use the sort of beginning with a stand-up uh, monologue, going into the conversation and the banter, interspersed with the musical performances. All right, I'm going to go into historiography, and then we are going to get into our conversation. So just really quickly, these are, so in the early 1990s, there was sort of an explosion of um, scholarship into professional antebellum 
um, blackface history. These three books really represent that. And one thing that they all basically argue is that blackface creates a collective whiteness in the 20, in the 19th century. So I know that sounds confusing, like what on earth does that mean? Basically the concept is that if somebody is able to apply blackface paint or make themselves black for a performance, and if they can then wash it off, they are inherently not black because they can remove the blackness. And so Eric Lott, who is a brilliant cultural scholar, describes blackface caricature as sort of the established 19th century theatrical practice in the urban north. And he argues that it really solidifies the gender racial hierarchy through what he calls love and theft or attraction and repulsion, which basically means that if someone is engaging in racial appropriation, there is some sort of love underneath that. There is some sort of envy underneath that. But at the same time, you, by physically embodying it, are trying to master and control it. And so that um, sort of dialectic is, is really interesting. And I should say that Eric Lott's book, Love and Theft, is also uh, where Bob Dylan gets his album uh, title from. And so it's had really interesting legs beyond just historiography. Um, David Rodiger publishes immediately after, and he basically is arguing that this very romantic idea about the plantation South is a way to sort of mediate anxieties about the industrial North. Uh, so this moment when we have these incredibly uh, exploitative factories in the North and you have Irish immigrants coming from the potato famine and you have German immigrants who have survived the 1848 revolution, that they are really, um, becoming white and becoming American as opposed to these ethnic immigrants by both mastering this form of whiteness in America, which is mastery over African Americans. Um, and it's also this just incredible escape and release from this working class existence. And I should say, and this is difficult to say, the the problem with blackface is these shows are incredibly fun. They, I mean, you're the fact that you're allowed to run up on stage and demand that the, the um, you know, performer does it again and again and again for you and you can shoot off your gun and you can drink and you can do whatever you want in there, it is a fantastic release of energy. Um, and finally, uh, Michael Rogan's book, Blackface, White Noise, carries this on through the film age by looking at Al Jolson, who is in The Jazz Singer, the first uh, major motion picture with sound. And he, this is where the famous mammy scene comes from that I put on the uh, landing page for you. And he's arguing that film then sort of takes up this mantle where theatrical uh, blackface on the stage left off around 1900. So just to sum up, I'm gonna show you this sort of timeline. If you were to add up all of the 20 existing history books about blackface that currently exist about professional shows, this is sort of the timeline that they argue for. I personally think that this is too neat a timeline when you take uh, amateur blackface into consideration. I think your timeline suddenly looks like this. And I wanna talk about this for a minute. So this will be our first moment of sort of conversation, which is to say, if I was a historian 100 years in the future, and I wanted to know how people consumed and interacted with popular entertainment today in 2019, what would be the platform or what would be the venue that I would look at? What would you say? Okay. Alex Chrisman, uh, Katie Willett, both uh, Instagram, meme, mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. What else? How do you, what, okay, YouTube. How about music? How do you interact with music? Jacqueline Duke, Spotify, Jamie Latham, good friend in North Carolina, videos. Sure, I'll, yeah. repeat, I'll repeat the question. So I'm asking if 100 years from now, a historian wanted to talk about what venues or platforms Americans went to consume mass media or entertainment right now, what would, what would they be studying or what would they point to? So we have all kinds of answers coming in. Okay. All right, great. So you're starting to, to 
catch on to the fact that we have many digital platforms. And that, I think, if you were to ask our students, they would almost universally say Netflix, Hulu, the internet, Spotify, Twitter. But take a step back from this for a moment. Think about this. Yes, we can definitively point to the beginning of when Netflix was founded, when YouTube was founded, when podcasts sort of take off. Um, but, you know, when I visit my parents, they're, they have Netflix and they have Hulu, but they also have a lot of DVDs and they listen to CDs in the car. And when I visit my grandmother, who's approaching 100, she can only watch TV in real time. She has no way to record it. Um, and she listens to an enormous amount of radio. And she also has vinyl record collection. And a lot of my students have vinyl record collections. And so my point is here, while new forms of technology or media are changing or advancing, they don't drop out of society. We don't lose the other forms of technology. What's actually happening is they start overlapping and compounding. And so when you think about this in terms of blackface, in the 20th century, you're able to get blackface from the theater, from school, from film, from television, animation, cartoons, these printed books, radio, and the internet simultaneously. And so instead of it being sort of this serial supplantation, it's actually overpowering and overburdening you with this exposure to these caricatures all the time. And so that really kind of gives it power and weight into making it seem like it's it's really true and real. That these stereotypes um, um, are based on something or grounded in something. And I think Meredith, uh, I'm going to reword her comment just a little bit, sure. but I'm uh, but I'm also struck by the the notion that um, formal radio programs, uh, record albums, DVDs these these are things that are professionally produced, whereas much of the social media that you listed is produced by individual people with their phones, right? So it, it compounds to the number of producers and the number okay. of consumers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, Julie wants me to, to speak briefly about African-Americans and blackface. I can definitely go more in depth in the Q&A, but I will say right now that yes, this is very important. So when we, so Jim Crow America pretty much established 1896 plus C.V. Ferguson. We have uh, segregation in America. One of the most uh, pervasive ways to trap Black Americans in the South so that they were working in sort of mitigated sharecropping was vagrancy laws. So this idea that if you were trying to leave that you were, you know, illegal just by your attempts to move. The one very bizarre loophole uh, which makes sense because it's what Americans wanted, was if you were a blackface performer, you could ride the rails and you did not have to be in a segregated car. You can go anywhere you want. And so sort of like the joke of running away to the circus, a lot of African-Americans uh, run away to blackface. That being said, there's a lot of people like James Weldon Johnson, for example, who um, writes the Black National Anthem. He becomes the head of the NAACP. He's a classically trained performer, him and his brother, Rosamond uh, Johnson, and they also perform with a man named Bob Cole. This is at the turn of the 20th century, right when these Jim Crow laws um, come about. They quickly discover that nobody wants um, three African Americans to write a black opera. And so what they do is they unfortunately have to turn to coon songs. Their first major musical is called A Trip to Coon Town. But what they do is they try to create these black performance spaces for all black cast, black directors, um, black composers within this medium. And what they're really trying to change in the lyrics is ideas about black love, ideas about black families, and also engage in satire. So a white audience might not get the jokes, but the African-American audience has absolutely understood that they were speaking on multiple levels. Um, but I will come back to this in a few minutes, I promise. Um, uh, what is the definition of a coon song? Sure. A coon song is um, a turn of the 20th century song that has a syncopated rhythm. So um, Scott Joplin is probably the most famous ragtime song that's syncopated the um, entertainer song. Uh, coon songs are written by white people and they imitate ragtime, but with very, very violent uh, imagery and lyrics. So I can show you some examples towards the end. All right, let me jump ahead just so we can make sure to get everything. All right, so let's go back to Jim Crow. 
So I told you he is the number one uh, character in the 19th century. This painting is in the uh, City for the Museum of the City of New York, and it is the only representation that was created in that moment. And I'm going to show you a close up here. So you can see on the right hand side, uh, T.D. Rice says Jim Crow is dancing. He has his fiddler player and then there's just brawls all around him. Um, and now this is the sheet music that the sheet music is really the key to how this spreads because only a few thousand people are in the Bowery that night, but it starts taking off around the globe. So the first thing I want to do here is just take a few minutes and let's look at this, this image. What stereotypes do you see? How does this make you feel? What is this arguing to you? What, what do you notice about this image of Jim Crow? And this, I should say, is from the 1830s. So we'll take a moment and let folks analyze the image. Tattered clothing, shoes falling apart. Thank you, Tammy. Impoverished, comical, comical, I'm assuming in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Yes, slave cabin's correct. Yes, this is America definitely plays on Jim Crow. Thanks, Carol. Uh, Carl. Answers. All right. Yeah. Okay. So these these are all really strong answers. So yeah. So Jim Crow, his uh, the way he works in these shows essentially is he is the bumbling fool. He is a slave who is happy to be enslaved because he has his food provided for him. He has his house provided for him. And the argument is basically that all they do is go sing and dance in the fields all day, which we know is absolutely not true in any capacity. Um, but he is very much, if you think of like zippity doo -dah, Uncle Remus, he is in that lineage of representing um, a storyteller, a trickster, but not a, not a negative trickster, more like it's someone who's um, quite charming and delightful. He's not gonna hurt you. Um, I have an interesting theory about the shoe. I actually think this is a a shoe that's modified so he can spin faster on stage um, because basically mass produced dance shoes don't exist yet. But yes, this is overall image of everything being tattered. And also if you notice nothing matches, it's hard to see, but he has like stripes and then polka dots and then checkers and he has straw hat. Um, what about his facial expression or his fingers? What, how does that make you feel? Yes, we got clownish, definitely. Definitely an odd angle. His body is contorted strangely. Yeah, definitely leering. Claws, animalistic. Yes, there's a lot of conflation of African Americans with animals, especially children. The unfortunate term is pickaninnies, and a lot of times they're also represented as animals. Yes, he looks subhuman. Great. Okay, now I'm going to show you his foil, Zip Coon. So Zip Coon is the other major antebellum character. He's created two years after T.D. Rice's Jim Crow. He's created by George Washington Dixon. What do you see and notice about Zip Coon? What vibes does he give you? What is, how is his clothes the same or different? What do you think is going on? Sophisticated, says Owen from Durham, more polished. Yeah, good point, Tracy. <laughs> All right, re really good. And where do you, if you had to take a guess, where do you think he lives, Sip Coon? <laughs> Sexy, sketchy. North, <laughs> <laughs> Marlene urban environment <laughs> inside the house. 
Yeah, so you guys really pick up on this very quickly, correct. So he is the urban dandy foil. He lives in, uh, he's represented in Philadelphia, New Orleans, New York City, um, Charleston. He definitely is represented as having incredibly wealthy clothes, but once again, still mismatched. This idea of any attempt to assimilate is never quite done correctly. He's still completely clownish. He is a jokester. He is a gambler. He is a ladies man. Um, but there, I will say that some people have also suggested that he is um, possibly homosexual. Um, and he is, as someone said, used car salesman. That would be correct. He is a con artist. So where Jim Crow will play a joke on you, it'll be funny and silly and you all laugh. Sip Coon will kind of screw you over. So that's interesting that you picked that up. Um, yes, and, and still, you know, not quite human. But I, what I will say is that the antebellum characters are strangely more human and realistic than what we get in the 20th century, where you have these huge overdrawn lips, huge overdrawn eyes. Um, and so uh, tracking how those develop is quite interesting. He's normally considered to be quite flashy. Um, and he's also a political junkie. So he's always talking about politics, but gets everything wrong. And so once again, we have this sort of marriage between black face and politics at the very beginning. All right. Um, the third prominent character, and here they are next to each other, so you can see how they're foil, the rural and the urban. And and together, I should say that that pretty much sets up a damned if you do, damned if you don't. You're either backwards and um, rural, or you're urban and you're, you know, trying too hard. The third character is what they call the mulatto wench. Sorry that these are a little out of focus. What do you see here? What is going on? These are from the Christie Minstrel and the Virginia Minstrel Company. Um, why called mulatto? Why a wench? What's going on? Tell me what you see. Hmm. Yeah, good point, Jimmy. All right, interesting, interesting. So first of all, I will confirm that they are performed in drag. These are always performed by men in blackface. So when I said that these are both racist but also very sexist, yes. Why mulatto and why a wench? And some of you are pointing out that there is a weird flirtation and looking away going on simultaneously. So try and break down for me what you think is being argued with the body posture and the name of the character. So why mulatto, why a wench? What do you see is that relationship uh, Alex offers? Perhaps she has a desire for white culture or station. Uh, good point, Meredith. Yeah, so you guys are picking up on it. So the tragic mulatto in antebellum literature is uh, both a justification for essentially slave rape. So in after the internal sorry, after the international slave trade is shut down in 1808, the U.S. has to repopulate and grow the slave population domestically. And so that is unfortunately, um, this, this means that African-American women, in addition to their physical labor, have to reproduce the new labor force. And this primarily is through um, forced reproduction. And being performed by a man in drag also suggests essentially that these are laborers, that these are people who are working. Um, but there's sort of this weird joke that she's also a Southern belle. And yes, there is some strange sexuality going on here, or at least being suggested. Now I wanna show you what happens after the Civil War. After the Civil War, Zip Coon continues, sometimes he's called Rastus. Jim Crow absolutely continues. 
Mulatto wench disappears. You will not find her pretty much ever. What you get is Mammy. Mammy was not in the shows before the Civil War. What, what stereotypes are being argued to you here with Mammy? What do you see in these representations? Okay, women's in charge, so a change in sort of the traditional gender roles of the 19th century. What else? House servant, aggressive, not sexual. She seems very angry, correct? And also look at how I said that after the Civil War, the stereotypes become more crude and grotesque. So you might look at a physical representation as well. Good. So you're picking up on a lot of it. So basically, Mammy is very desexualized all of a sudden. She is no longer this sexual temptress. She's no longer beautiful and attractive. She has her hair covered. Um, you know, her, her, her comportment is completely different. And there's this idea that um, the women are in charge, that there's a, um, a feminine quality to African-American men in relation to Mammy. Um, and probably the most famous example, example of Mammy is Gone with the Wind. Um, and Hattie McDaniels did actually start her career when she was a child in blackface shows. Um, so the reason I wanna point this out is your students likely are still continuing to consume some of these stereotypes. So someone mentioned um, Mrs. Butterworth and Jemima, yes. That still continues, but also in contemporary films. So I'm gonna show you a few examples. All right, so Medea. Medea is off the charts when it comes to uh, film cells. And look at her demeanor, and once again, drag. Um, look at the gun. Okay, Big Mama's house, drag. And Norbert. So what are you guys seeing there in terms of how these stereotypes are continuing? And I said that we were going to talk about black blackface. So we are actually in sort of a renaissance of African-American producers who engage in um, what I'll call minstrelsy, not blackface, meaning they're not blacking up. They are actual African-Americans, but they are engaging in some of these longer trajectories and caricatures, which we could, we could debate is this satire or you know what else is going on here? So what do you see with Big Mama, with Medea, and with Norbert? Mm -hmm. What do you feel they're arguing about African-American families? So my question here is, why would the mulatto wench disappear at slavery, or I mean at the Civil War, and why would Mammy and this sort of big mama emerge during Jim Crow? What's, what's happening there with their context? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would say that the quickest answer is definitely arguing against any form of interracial sexuality, but especially interracial marriage. This idea of it's no longer socially functional and what you're gonna get is essentially a problem. And so um, also we can talk about the sort of ideas of welfare queens and how that's continued on in this sort of longer conversation. Um, and so one thing I will say is, <laughs> These images are incredibly upsetting when you look at them back to back to back. So I always like to use sort of a um, chaser. So if you need a reminder of black love and black marriage, I am here to bring it for you. Um, and I think that that's something important to do for students to say, 
um, you know, what is reality? What is reality? And why do we have these resurgence of stereotypes when African Americans are successful and in moments of power? All right, so you guys did a wonderful job with that. The last little question that I have for you, um, so for the, for the 19th century, is the Virginia minstrels by the 1840s go on a global blackface tour. And I want to share with you the places that they go. And I want you to tell me what you think the connection is. So they leave from New York and they go to Ireland. They go to Australia. They go to London. They go to New Zealand. They go to Tasmania and they go to South Africa. So Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, Tasmania, and Africa. And I'll give you a minute to respond. Yeah, so you're, you're picking up on it. So when we talk about blackface, this is America's first international cultural export. So jazz doesn't exist yet, blues doesn't exist yet. The minstrel show is really the American contribution. We don't yet know about spirituals globally until around the 1870s when the Fist Jubilee singers start um, traveling globally. And so yes, you're seeing a global white supremacist humor that is completely predicated on American racial stereotypes born of slavery. And so I think that that's another important thing to keep in mind and help your students understand. Um, I'm gonna show you a few pictures quickly and then I think it's time that we open the floor and have some questions. So the last thing I really wanna say about the 19th century is um, most of these shows occurred in the Bowery. These are Bowery boys on the left. Um, and on the right, you have the Virginia Minstrels of the Virginia Serenaders. This is what the five points looks like. Um, this is where the bulk of these shows are taking place. So you can see this is a chaotic place. This is an interracial place. This painting is at the Met and it is online. If you put in the five points um, into the Met's website, we don't know the artist again, um, but I do think that it's actually one of the most fantastic paintings to have a conversation with um, the students when you blow it up. Unfortunately, we can't get it much larger, but I just sort of want to show it to you. Um, and this is the same intersection, one and two. This is May 1st or moving day in Antivalma, America, where everyone would have to move and change places. And I just think it's a wild um, painting. Um, but it gives you sort of this idea of like the chaos of where these shows are really born. And I, and I want to point this out because, you know, we talk about the culture wars in America. In the 19th century, the culture wars were real. So theaters were the site where most race riots erupt. And in the 19th century, race riots were the other way around. They're typically white perpetrated against African-Americans. Um, and so I just want to mention three quickly that you can look into that, that might be excellent um, starting points for your class. So the first is the 1822 African theater riot and the 1834 Farron riot. And I will get these uh, for you, I'll type them out, um, which included 4,000 anti-abolitionist protesters. So these were pro-slavery New Yorkers who congregate at the Bowery, which is where Jim Crow performed. And they erupt into a riot and they were watching a performance of Metamora by Edwin Forrest, which was a um, play about Native American life. And they basically all start chanting, let us have Zip Coon, let us have Zip Coon. And Zip Coon, uh, Washington Dixon basically gets up and he performs for this audience um, outside and he gives a brief address and that finally sort of made the crowds disperse. But in 1848, we have the Astor Place riots, which was an incredibly violent um, riot. There was 1,800 attendees at the Astor Opera House. They were going to see a Shakespearean performance by Forrest, who is an American actor, and William Charles McCready, who is a British actor. And it spurred 10,000 New Yorkers to riot over issues of nativism. Um, and it resulted in 25 deaths 
and the state militia had to come in. So you, we have this idea or this moment where um, blackface plays are completely linked to political power, but also this uh, public expression of what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be a white citizen, what it means to own a physical space, and what it means to um, physically and very publicly enact uh, racial violence. Um, so really quickly, I just want to say my book, uh, which is forthcoming, really sort of uses the Civil War as the launching period to dive into what it means when everyday Americans um, start performing in blackface. And the title of my talk today came from a line in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s final speech. Um, it was the last speech he gave before he was assassinated. And he said, let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. Let us develop a dangerous unselfishness. And it's an unselfishness in reckoning with our institutional past, with its legacies, and how we might have intergenerationally benefited from it. Um, and also the realization that that journey is quite dangerous, that people will oppose it because um, the idea of what new world could be possible if that reckoning actually took place, what rebuilding could occur. And this line of dangerous unselfishness has really been stuck in my head since the Northam um, admissions, because historical memory of this magnitude, 70 million people in America going to federally sponsored blackface shows, that's not just accidentally forgotten, right? So what we remember and what we forget and the stories that we tell have very real world implications for our present day. And I show two examples. Here we have a uh, blackface Halloween costume of Trayvon Martin. Um, and then also the fact that the Baltimore cops in the Freddie Gray uh, murder case were trying to raise money through an amateur blackface minstrel show, which sort of, sort of tells you some insight into how they were understanding racial stereotypes to begin with. But the power of these stories and their refusal to remain hidden and their continued resuscitance in our own historical moments of national consciousness over these caricatures derived clearly in historical fantasy, we have shown that today, do you have this ability to take and sustain life in America. And so that's why it's really important to teach this in our classrooms. Um, you know, some students perform in blackface when they dress up as Kanye West or Jay-Z or Beyonce, people they really admire and they do it um, to try and um, you know, express their love and admiration, but they don't know what they're resurrecting when they do it. But then we also do have very clear examples like in Minnesota right now of children using blackface to taunt African-American students and engage in this continued legacy of violence. So I really hope that this very brief introduction to blackface um, can help you start a conversation in your classes. And I'm here to answer any of your questions. And I do also want to say that if you want to see my uh, larger lecture, um, you know, I actually really hope that we can also get this up um, through the seminar series as well. So I will be in conversation with them about that. But thank you so much. And I am looking forward to all of your questions to hear what you want to know. Thank you, Raylan, and I'll, I'll give you a moment to uh, to catch your breath and maybe uh, take a drink of water and and actually kind of pull pull us back to some of the comments you made at the very beginning, which is um, the power, uh, the empowerment, really, of asking students to investigate and shine a light on these kinds of histories. That in and of itself is an incredibly powerful uh, experience and skill set and uh, perspective that will not be able to be unrung once given. So um, I encourage all of our participants tonight to see this as not just a conversation online, but this is actually something that that they can implement and they can uh, guide their own students in in having these kinds of um, these kinds of moments. Yes, and I will say I do have a lot of experience working through the Hutchins Center at Harvard, creating um, African American research programs and curricula at uh, high schools in Chicago and so I have experience creating sort of little modules that you could use in your own schools to look into blackface locally so if that's something you want to do um, I agree once once those floodgates open and we sort of get this story out um, it's a lot harder for these sort of abuses to to continue to happen agreed well we have a few minutes uh, left in our session tonight and and the questions are starting to queue up so I'm gonna 
I'll Go take the it. order and I'm going to uh, give you a few minutes to respond. So first from Julie Trotter, who's a community college educator, professor of uh, community college at, uh, in North Carolina asks, Addison Skurlock, who is a North Carolina photographer that moved to Washington, D.C., said that he took photos of famous African-Americans to show black youth their culture and to uh, counteract the damage of blackface. Do you think that he and other photographers have made a difference in that sort of initiative? Um, so I'm not personally familiar with his work, but I will say, um, just as I am trying to model for you right now by showing these beautiful daguerreotypes of real black families, I think the more that we can do to change racial representation to something that's grounded in reality can only be uh, for the benefit of everybody and to um, you know diversify the conversation. So yeah, I think that that's important. Thank you. Uh, Alex Christman asks, uh, could you expand just a little bit on what you said regarding California public schools and internment camps at the very beginning? Yes, yeah, so that's what, um, I have an hour lecture that is traveling around the country right now. And basically one of the things my book, my book, sorry, I'm starting to get tongue tied here. My book explores is during the Great Depression and World War II, because all of these political men and power in Jim Crow America are so used to performing in blackface and they think of it as a way to um, express American patriotism. They really advocate during the with the WPA, uh, the Works Progress Administration, that blackface be instituted into all uh, school curriculum. And because the internment camps school curriculum was the California school curriculum under uh, Earl Warren, who was the governor at the time, um, that becomes a requirement and one of the things that I argue in my book is essentially Japanese Americans were supposed to perform in blackface to show their American patriotism and that they had learned how to be a good American. But when you speak to survivors who were in, and I should use the proper phrase, concentration camps, they sort of just laugh and they say, listen, I was an American citizen born in America. I watched the same Warner Brothers cartoons they did, everyone else. I already knew these stereotypes. I didn't need to learn them. I just got up and performed it because that was taught to me as well as an American child. And so it's a pretty interesting uh, moment of racial tri uh, triangulation where the, the federal government really does see them as enemy aliens who need to learn how to be American. And the Japanese American children are like, mm, okay, we're in the same California public schools. We've already mastered this and can sing Oh Susanna uh, any way you want it. And there's also an interesting legacy of blackface in Japan. So their parents and grandparents were also exposed to it. So during um, the opening up of Japan in the 19th century, uh, blackface was brought to Japan from the American Navy. So it's an interesting, complicated story. Thank you. Uh, here's a question for Melanie Murata, who asks, sorry, just one second. It just sure. scrolled right, right out of view. There it is. Uh, Melanie asks, would you take a moment and discuss the use of blackface by fashion houses? Yes, super interesting. So I've actually worked with some fashion designers in New York City who were trying to address this issue. And they gave me some really interesting insight, which is a lot of the, t uh, so in both training, if you're going to school to be a fashion designer, but also the way a lot of the fashion houses run, is they create these uh, vision boards, sort of like, um, you know, almost like Pinterest, and they select images, uh, fabric swatches, uh, textures that they want to move forward. And because things have so many steps, I mean, some of these fashion houses, there's literally 20 different divisions that go through something. A lot of times the later meaning or manifestation is completely divorced from its original source. And so there is rampant uh, reappropriation going on. And also, as you might expect, a lot of these houses are um, primarily white and often European. So there is not the same, uh, so it's interesting, it's not the same exposure to American racial stereotypes, but they certainly have exposure to blackface through colonialism and imperialism. So if you look at um, the Netherlands, for example, they have an incredible blackface issue every Christmas. And so it's not that they don't know what blackface is, um, it's just there's quite a different understanding and context. But that, that does seem to be one of the major issues is this sort of repurposing of things that lose their meaning in this abstraction. 
And so a lot of the houses like Gucci are trying to hire diversity chiefs who will look at something and make sure that it is appropriate um, for public consumption. That's a great point, thank you. Um, uh, Tammy Sweeney uh, reflects a little bit on some of the more modern film images that you showed. Uh, and she yes. asked whether or not you think that the use of black caricatures in some of these modern black films is an attempt to take back those negative images, the way that negative language is taken back and used by communities. Um, so I'm not sure which films you are referencing by, you mean like Spike Lee's Gamboozled or, uh, okay, White Chicks, okay. Um, yeah, so I do think that there's no question that they're engaging in satire and trying to take back that power. But I, I will say, um, while they make an enormous amount of money and very positive things have been done with that money, it continues to run the risk sometimes that James Weldon Johnson and his brother ran up against at the turn of the 20th century, which is your audience, your immediate audience might understand the satire or the double meaning, but um, the random person who finds it online and is watching it at two in the morning and doesn't have the context might not understand. And so some of those stereotypes, unfortunately, are still perpetuated. And so that's a really honest conversation that needs to happen in Hollywood about how to properly address those stereotypes. Mm. Uh, similarly, or maybe on a, a similar theme, Carl Rosen asks, um, what are your feelings about analyzing the Childish Gambino, This Is America video? How do you see that as using a, that as a video text in which modern students may see or hear of Jim Crow for the first time? I definitely have done that. I did that at recently at UC Berkeley in the spring. Um, so if you haven't seen the music video, I definitely recommend that you look at it. And I think it's really interesting to have students analyze the entire film. There's a lot of references to the Confederacy, obviously police brutality. Um, and so the chorus, which I'm blanking on, but it's something like, you know, black man, get your money, get your money. And he keeps singing and dancing and making these hyper um happy faces that's completely in the lineage of Jim Crow and this idea of performance and um, exploitation and I also think it's an important film to open up the larger conversation between the relationship of these white supremacist comedy shows that essentially brainwash you into thinking racism is funny and what that can mean in terms of real world violence. So there is the scene in that music video of the uh, Charleston choir um, being assassinated. That's, um, you know, sort of almost an afterthought. And that's sort of the point in the music video. He turns and kills him and he keeps walking and singing and dancing. And, and also a larger commentary on America, the way in which we are um, able to just move on and forget that violent moment and go on to the next because we like the song and it has a happy beat so we're not paying attention i think there's a ton of things i mean you could do an entire hour lecture just on analyzing that film with students so i definitely encourage you to do that raylan i'm going to uh, conclude tonight's session with my own question um and and it's one uh, you know in some ways many of the participants that we have tonight are working with students that you may find in your classroom at princeton in a year two years three years when you have these same conversations with your college students, your undergraduate students, how do they react? What is, what is some of the what are some of the obstacles or some of the epiphanies that they have as they consider these kinds of connections? Um, so it's interesting. So I've only been teaching at Princeton for one year, but I've taught at USC in California. I've taught at Berkeley, and those students were uh, quite open about the fact that something like Big Mama or um, you know the Nutty Professor are things they grew up seeing um, and were completely exposed to, but didn't have a longer context for the lineage. Um, but as some, of, some of these universities, Princeton being an example, but honestly, most of these universities have um, quite active fraternal and sorority traditions. Um, I have encountered them myself. It's no coincidence that I did this project while serving as a college photographer. And so I encountered some scary and frightening things and wanted to understand them myself as I was being asked to go to these random parties and take photographs. Um, my college students tend to be uh, horrified on one hand, as we all are, but also start to see that it's really the fabric of 
the basis of almost anything in American popular culture. So I do teach a class on American culture at large, 1800 to 1970. That's also listed on my website if you want to look at the syllabus. Um, there's plenty of things to play around with. And um, yeah, one of the major things that I argue in the first lecture is slavery itself was a form of entertainment. If you've ever seen uh, 12 Years a Slave or read Solomon Northrup's slave narrative, I mean, he is basically purchased because he had musical talents and skills. And when T.D. Rice says he goes down south and watches a slave to get the song and the dance, that's part of what he's, he's going to do. He's going to the slave markets. He's going um, to, to see what he believed was authentic black performance. And so I do think that students start to understand that this is sort of um, the thread that holds all of American cultural landscape together. Raylan, I want to thank you for your time tonight and for the scholarship that you're doing in this area. I very much appreciate uh, your willingness to share your teaching strategies and your resources and to lead us in this complex conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for everybody who's on the front lines in the schools. And like I said, I'm more than happy to help you if you want to reach out. I'd also like to thank all of our participants tonight and invite you to follow the National Humanities Center through our social media and visit our website to see upcoming uh, activities and uh, different kinds of projects and programs that we have that will address uh, similarly important and relevant topics in the very near future. Um, and I hope that I see many of you at our next webinar. It's actually two nights from now. I'll we'll be working with Leanne Wheeler, who's a professor of history at Binghamton University in New York. Uh, we'll be talking about the First Amendment and the ways that consumer rights have been born of the First Amendment. Thank you again so much for your time tonight and for your thoughtful conversation. Uh, we hope that you find these resources uh, relevant and, ho and helpful. Uh, the recording of tonight's session will be posted within 48 hours, usually, uh, on our YouTube channel, and we look forward to working with you again in the future. Thank you. Have a great day at school tomorrow. Good night.